very much everyone for being here. Um, uh, first of all, just uh, GTBR compliance. <laughs> Today we are trying to live stream the event. Uh, so if you have any concern, uh, please let me know. But you won't be in the, uh, uh, in the picture unless you storm the podium here. Um, but obviously if you ask any questions, your voice might get picked up. Um, anyway, so thank you very much for, like I said, thank you very much for being here. So this is the open day um, of the Academic Center of Excellence for Cybersecurity Research. If you're here for planetarium, geography, <laughs> lecture, something, you're in the wrong room. Uh, <laughs> I guess you, you figured that already. Uh, anyway, so my name is Emiliano de Cristofaro, if you, if you don't know me. Uh, I'm a professor here at UCL. I work on privacy and, uh, and security. And uh, for the past year, I've been serving as the director of the uh, ACE, the Academic Center of Ex Excellence, uh, which was really Jens's, Jens growth <laughs> uh, baby. So I really inherited this uh, in, in a sort of positive sense of the word. Like he established it, he got- Because now it's a teenager. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, you know, he- <laughs> With the trouble start. Part, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the, the weaning and everything. And uh, so then, you know, it got, got it renewed um, uh, about two years ago. Uh, and, you know, since uh, uh, Jens is uh, now in, in industry, um, I sort of took over. Uh, so for, if, if you're not familiar with uh, the concept of uh, ACE, uh, so essentially it's a, it's a certification that uh, the UK government through uh, GCHQ and NCSC and PPSRC gives to a university uh, with respect to, like the name suggests, the excellence of the research that they do in, in the broad cybersecurity area. Um, so there are, I think at the moment, uh, um, 13 centers, if I'm not mistaken, uh, spread around the UK. Um, and this, you know, besides the sort of stamp of approval, also creates a community of universities and researchers uh, working in this space. So we have, for instance, annual uh, meetings, we have uh, various kinds of events, uh, we have studentships, we have uh, projects, uh, um, and so on and so forth. So it's kind of a really nice way to, to like I said, to, have, to build a network of cybersecurity cyber researchers um, in, in the UK. Um, so we've been um, awarded the, the Center of Excellence uh, uh, right from the start. Um, and you know we have a number of uh, uh, of researchers in, in, in at UCL, uh, not only in computer science, um, and, and we cover a really really broad uh, range of, uh, of sort of cybersecurity areas. So this is these are this is our new website. Um, and by the way, a big shout out thanks to Kilian who uh, who designed it, sitting red right, right there. Um, so you can see sort of the some examples uh, and non-exhaustive list of uh, um, things that, that we cover. Uh, so ranging from you know, privacy anonymous communications to uh, sort of software security, system security. We have a big tradition on uh, uh, human factors of security, uh, cryptography, cryptocurrencies, blockchain, so uh, the more the merrier. Um, we have you know, a few things that are um, uh, sort of associated to the center. Uh, obviously, you know, we, um, we have uh, an information security research group, which obviously uh, fits nicely into, into the center uh, with, uh, you know, a, a, a few faculty um, in, in, in information security, but there are other faculty in computer science that, that work on cybersecurity related things. Uh, and like I said, also other departments. So we have uh, uh, people in security and crime science, as well as uh, STEP, the Department of Science, Technology, Engineering, and Public Policy, that also fit very well with, uh, with, with the center. Uh, we have, a, uh, since uh, this year, we also have a doctoral training center, again, sponsored by, uh, funded by uh, EPSRC. Uh, so we have a number of students that are, are funded through it. So we are now in the first uh, cohort. Uh, we have an MSc in information security. So we have a number of students every year that specialize, get a specialized masters in, in this field. Um, we have a hacking seminar, um, ethical hacking seminar, I should say, <laughs> <laughs> every week. Uh, we also have uh, weekly seminars, weekly uh, research, research seminars. 
Uh, so as you can see on our webpage, we actually have a, a calendar of events. So you can see pretty much every week uh, and we have, we have at least one seminar. Uh, and those happen uh, on Thursdays, 4 p.m. Uh, so we have both internal speakers, so you know maybe some some of us, some students uh, get a paper accepted, and you know we, we do a, maybe a dry run of uh, the conference presentation, or you know uh, students who graduate they give a talk about you know their PhD work, but more often than not we actually have external speakers, both from industry and academia, both from the UK and worldwide. Uh, so overall, these are, uh, I'm just gonna sort of uh, skim through the, um, our, our members. Uh, so that you can see we have people in all departments, or BART, the software engineering. Ingolf is gonna uh, uh, talk today. Ingolf is one of the new uh, recruits uh, in our center. He joined the uh, Department of Security and Crime Science uh, less than a year ago, I think, about a year ago. Uh, so he's going to introduce himself with, with a nice talk. Uh, Tristan uh, Caulfield does security economics. Uh, David Clark, uh, who does uh, malware analysis information flow control. Uh, Nicolas Courtois, uh, who's a cryptographer and cryptanalysis uh, ex expert. Uh, George Donezis, who does privacy blockchains. Myself, you already know me. Uh, Mark Handley, who does networking um, and network security. Shane Johnson, who uh, works in, uh, in crime science, who's a professor of future crimes. Uh, Brad Karp, who, who does system security, Jens Krinke, uh, vulnerability detection and static analysis, Sarah Michael-John, who does cryptography and security, uh, Enrico, who is also uh, a new recruit in, in the Department of Security and Crime Science, does malware and cybercrime. He was also supposed to talk, but unfortunately uh, he couldn't make it. Last minute he had a, a sort of family emergency. Uh, he sends his apologies and, um, and so, we also have a little bit more time now in our in our, in our shadow. Uh, Stephen, uh, uh, sitting in front, uh, live streaming events, <laughs> who's, uh, who's an expert in anonymous communications, uh, uh, security, usability, payments, and so on. Uh, Mirko is actually in the Department of Geography as, is, uh, as a data scientist um, and uses uh, data science apply to cybersecurity privacy. Simon does human centered security, David Pim logic, policy, and economics. Uh, Angela Sasse does human-centered security. Uh, Leoni is also going to talk today. He, uh, she, she's a lecturer in, in the uh, STEP department um, in international security emergency technologies. Uh, she also joined uh, the center a couple of years ago now. Um, so we, we welcome her with, by giving, by giving, by having her give a talk, sorry. <laughs> so she does a lot of work on cybersecurity, surveillance, and, and gender issues. Uh, and finally, last but not least, Shi Tzu, uh, who does a lot of work on bots detection uh, and epidemic spread. Uh, so if you have any questions about the center, please come see me uh, at the end of this session or throughout the day. I'd be happy to sort of answer any questions. If you wanna get involved with projects, with collaborations, uh, we, we're here uh, where we are for, for this reason. So uh, before I, uh, we start with the talks, just uh, give uh, um, sort of a, an overview of the agenda. Uh, so like I said, we, we were supposed to have Enrico give a talk. Unfortunately, uh, he's not going to uh, make it. So we will have a little bit more time to, uh, for, the, for the talks and you know, for questions. Uh, and if you finish a little bit earlier, we can just have an open Q&A or grab some coffee. <laughs> Uh, so in this first part of the day, we have uh, talks by uh, center affiliates, and um, we, we really wanted to have uh, uh, sort of the new recruits um, and that, that are, are joining our center. I uh, already mentioned uh, Leoni uh, and Ingolf, and uh, we have two um, new faculty. Um, I think we haven't added them <laughs> yet on the page. Uh, yes, uh, uh, apologies about that. So Marie, who joined uh, two months ago, Right, uh, from about two months ago, uh, uh, from 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 the U.S., she joined as a as a lecturer um, and she, uh, in computer science and information security group, and you know she's going to give a talk and uh, introduce herself again, uh, uh, talking about cryptocurrency fraud. Uh, we also have Philip uh, from EPFL. He hasn't joined yet officially, but he's, he's already a UCL. Uh, <laughs> in, in, in his heart, so he's, he's going to join officially uh, in, in January. 
So it's going to the EPFL. Again, it's going to join as faculty in, the, um, in computer science in the information security group. Um, so Philip does a lot of work on uh, cryptography and, and blockchains and, and, and systems. So he's going to talk about uh, digital trust systems and randomness. So we just have sort of informal talks. I hope we can have nice discussions, nice questions. Uh, and then we'll have to move to a different building. It's just like less than five minutes walk away, uh, which is the Roberts Engineering Building. Uh, so we'll start over there at five. So you know, hopefully we'll be done here uh, by let's say twenty to five. Uh, so we have time to you know slowly walk, maybe chat a little bit more, grab uh, a tea or something like that. And uh, at five we'll have uh, a sort of a keynote talk and invited uh, a talk by uh, Vital Shmadikov from Cornell Tech. And then um, we'll finish with a nice uh, uh, dreams reception uh, just outside that room. So you can just follow us uh, to move to, to the other building, but on the Eventbrite page, you obviously can find um, uh, directions. So that's, that's all for me. Thanks again for, for being here. Uh, looking forward to, to a nice uh, event. Uh, like I said, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, as you said, I'm uh, Leonie Panzer. I'm a new lecturer at STEEK. We have a relatively long name called Science, Technology, Engineering, and Public Policy. So uh, I disclose it straight away. I'm a social scientist, uh, but I work on technological issues. And currently, a topic that keeps me awake at night and uh, busy throughout the day um, is how emerging systems affect some of the most vulnerable groups in society, specifically victims of domestic violence and abuse, or the overarching category, intimate partner violence. Um, so I'm gonna hopefully use the next 20 minutes or more, uh, you're gonna have to stop me anyway, um, uh, to talk a bit about that project that I'm uh, actually working with colleagues in the computer science department here. Um, and uh, I think a foundational premise for the whole talk is, I wanna deconstruct three things as a basis. Number one, is the neutrality of technology. If anyone who believes in this room that tech is neutral, we have to have a chat. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, that relates to how gender is ingrained in technology. Um, if you just open the newspaper, you will be haunted by uh, reports around how gender is ingrained in algorithms. Uh, and if you go to Argos down the road, you probably will see that smartphones are designed in a certain way that they simply don't fit in my hands. Um, uh, because they're primarily designed with uh, larger hands in mind for males, etc. And we have tons of other examples where we see that when systems, and they range from fMRI scans to IoT systems, that uh, designers who are often primarily male still, not necessarily think about all the use cases or misuse cases when they bring systems onto the market. And that brings me to the second point. I think we have to talk about the fact that the technological systems that we develop are often abused. Now those working in crime issues, you know about that, but I think the average software developer sitting, for example, in a company like Deliveroo or Adobe doesn't necessarily think about like why or how someone could misuse their platform for nefarious reasons. They probably think of like DDoS attacks or all the systems, but they don't think about often the intimate relationships, the person that sits next to you on the couch, that they might do something really nasty. So I wanna change the way we look at abuse in this context. And the last point that I wanna make is technology is changing. Now this is like a, a standard sentence you find in a funding application, how emerging technology is changing the, like the digital revolution and we need to uh, do something about it. I'm gonna run with the same thing. <coughs> but I do still think that uh, IoT systems, which is the focus of our research, do change the nature, extent, and scope of how tech abuse is currently happening. And that brings me to kind of setting the grounds around uh, what I'm working on, or we're working on. 
So tech abuse research, and tech abuse is a relatively broad category, you could say nearly like cybercrime is tech abuse. But when I talk about tech abuse, I refer primarily to IPV, intimate partner violence situations. Um, uh, is often, uh, and we have a long history around like online harassment research, so for example that certain groups of people are more likely to be harassed online, maybe that they are attacked directly, or they talked about, or there's certain uh, um, images being shared, so that relates to image-based abuse. Um, you probably, if you read the Wired or whatever uh, other outlet you're interested in, you probably have heard about this the term revenge porn, which is actually a really, um, well, I personally don't like to use, and many researchers don't like to use the idea of revenge porn because there's the idea that like there's an intent of the actor to have a revenge or a reason to have revenge. Often it's just, um, you know, someone taking a really nasty photograph of you or hacking into a system and taking images that were not meant for him or her and uploading them online. The other really uh, uh, interesting development is around cyber stalking or cyber enabled stalking. Um, again, uh, I, I'm fully aware that in this type of room and environment, cyber is not the nicest word to use, but still it is a common terminology uh, uh, discussed in the literature. And what that means is uh, how uh, abusers now use, for example, the internet um, as a means to stop and, and track a person's being. Um, and that relates to spyware, which is malicious software uh, often installed on phones or uh, in certain browsers where people also can track how and what people are looking at, when they're looking at, they often have key loggers associated with it so they're able to, for example, track your passwords, etc. Um, so there's a, a huge body of literature around these issues. Uh, and a recent development that uh, I hope um, there's the ambition, at least here uh, in UCL, that we would establish a single method of clinical computer security clinics that where researchers help victims and survivors to deal with rich tech abuse. But that is something that has not yet come to uh, uh, Europe and is currently actually being uh, conducted at Cornell Tech. So uh, I'm curious to hear this talk later on. Now, before I go further with IoT, I want to speak about the commonality that this type of research here has. Number one is there's a misuse and a repurposing of tech. So most of these systems, so for example, spyware, is never really, only on the really nasty websites, advertised as hacked into your wife's phone. Often it's about parental control, about work uh, monitoring, whatsoever, that just people then purchase and use for intimate partner violence situation. And I do want to mention at this stage, when I talked about intimate partner violence, often we see, have the image of like man to woman or woman to man. Actually, it works intergenerational as well. So parents monitoring children and children monitoring parents, cousins monitoring cousins. So it's the whole network uh, around here. The other thing uh, is, I, I consider these conventional technologies. So things that we have for a while and that should be doing better by now, like computers, smartphones, etc. cetera. Um, and unfortunately, primarily women and BAME groups, so black, Asian, minority, ethnic groups are affected by these forms of uh, abuse forms. And the other really important factor that we observe is that there's an active commitment from the perpetrator. So what I mean with that is, if you think about spyware, it's not just on your phone. I need to get your phone, install it, and then let the magic happen, right? So I think um, this is an important element I want to remind you when we talk about IoT systems, where actually the active element has completely dismantled. You don't need to be active anymore, it's just happening. Um, and so I'm coming to the ambiguous term, the Internet of Things. Uh, I'm sure uh, some of you grudge by hearing it. I know it's an umbrella term and it, a lot of categories fall into it. Um, may it be smart uh, toys, which actually we see in our research being abused in infant partner violence situations as well as a way to get back to the wife, for example. But also like uh, more uh, uh, mundane things like a smart kettle or a, a smart light bulb, etc. You think potentially that that sounds super mundane. Why would we even care about a smart light bulb being abused? But I really want to remind you um, about the context of intimate partner violence that it often happens not just as a tech abuse case, but there's other factors like emotional abuse, physical abuse that come into play where the question, why is this light bulb going off and on every morning at a certain period of time or when I'm taking a coffee? starts to creep into your mind and you're like, am I going crazy? Are things you know, 
have I not the capability of dealing with that system? What's going on and wrong? So I really want to set the scene here for, you might think this is like nothing, but in the context of intimate partner violence, where a person is already so extremely vulnerable, small things can set and mean so much more. And I think that's the reason why we really have to look at these smart systems and how they are abused. Now, here's your stats. Um, we don't know if they're right or wrong. Nevertheless, uh, what I want to showcase with the figures is the Internet of Things, all these systems are here to stay. Unfortunately, we're not having a button saying, that's it, we don't want them, and they will disappear. Most likely, they will expand, as the figures show, and as the appetite of regulators, policymakers, <coughs> technology companies shows, and even the public, they will be here. So, we approach this research from the perspective that it's better to intervene now as they are more in a mass and emerging environment than later on when we have tons, hundreds, millions, billions out there that we can't withdraw and get back anymore. Now, uh, there's enough research uh, uh, on the risks, uncertainties, and opportunities that the IoT brings. My colleague Irina Brass is here in the room. We're doing a lot of work in this. But I think my main critique with the body of work currently happening around IoT is we are primarily looking at how to harness economic value, how this is going to change, revolutionize society for the better. We might think about like the misuse in some circumstances with like uh, financial abuse, but then again we have an emotion, uh, an, an, an financial interest often. Now again, we can have a discussion about paint, whether you disagree with me, but still I think the majority of publications coming out in the IoT realm are still very driven by that. And I think one element that is missing in the literature, both in the tech abuse literature, so the social scientists, but also in the technical literature, is how, it, how technical systems we develop, or you develop, uh, are affecting society, especially vulnerable groups. Now, a core problem I struggle with for the last two years is, you might ask me, how big is that problem? How widespread is it? Now, I can give you that number. So uh, that's from Refuge. Refuge is a domestic abuse charity in the UK. Um, and they are one of the only charities in the UK currently collecting tech abuse data. So they have basically a tick box saying when a victim comes in or a survivor comes in, they talk to them and then say, okay, there's a tech element, tick, and then it goes in a specific category. Now, 920 cases between January and August doesn't sound much, right? But it's still a lot if you think about the broader scale of things. A, this is only one service. B, you know, it's still a person inserting that information, so how much is getting lost is uh, also unclear. And C, um, we have no understanding what in that big category of tech abuse is in there. It's like a bucket, but we haven't entangled, is it smartphones, is it spyware, is it browser issues, what it is. And I think that's a question that really uh, strikes me as something we need to have more information about and more research on. And other things I want you to think and consider is, we have a predefined idea of what, what a perpetrator looks like. That's why I set the scene at the start saying, when I said domestic abuse, you probably have the image of a battered woman with like a black eye and you thought about physical abuse. But abuse is so much more. And in the UK currently, there's a domestic abuse bill uh, happening uh, where we talk about coercion and control falling into an abusive uh, environment as well, where it's about uh, factors that like, we're no longer just thinking about like, um, uh, you know, physical violence being the predominant processor of like uh, abuse, but actually financial abuse, emotional coercion and control fall into that as well. But from your perspective, this is important as well, because when I think about like your uh, curriculum, I assume the majority of you talk about like the external threats. You might talk about internal threats when it comes to the company, but have you thought about when you design systems about like the person sitting next to you being a threat actor? And do we have an appropriate you know, threat model according to that? And how would that even look like? How do you even design systems for people that you share an environment with and that you can't just you know, through a firewall extract from there? The other thing is we have predefined ideas about what abuse looks like. As I said, uh, we primarily still think about like domestic, uh, domestic abuse as physical abuse, and that is a really big struggle for us to communicate with, for example, police and policymakers that you know really uh, primarily see these cases as more pressing, more important, or more real. And also the predefined ideas around what technologies look like. 
And that we, we see a lot working with support sector, the support sector that works with domestic, victim, uh, domestic violence victims and survivors, where they still think about smartphones, about how a smartphone works, and they assume just the way a computer and a smartphone works, that's how a, you know, a, a, a smart speaker will work. But often those things don't really translate one to one. And so how are you making sure that their understanding of technologies that they need to have on the radar when they talk to victims and make sure that they have a safety plan and a properly risk assessment are accounting for all the different technologies that are out there. Now, here comes an important point. I'm not doing this by myself. Um, uh, my colleague uh, Simon Parkin is unfortunately teaching uh, currently, but he's uh, at the um, at the computer science department. And we initially started with Professor George Danesis on the team, um, and uh, uh, we we then expanded and we got Dr. Tripti Patel, who is in the uh, STS department here, Isabel Lopez, and Julia Slupska to join us. Now I have to say we are a very fluctuating team because it depends on funding, but ultimately main goal is to continue to work on this space uh, as we progress and there's some increasing interest and appetite in that research space. And what we're doing, I uh, probably is uh, a good question. Um, I would say we're doing something called action research. Um, so we're not the type of people that go in a lab, test something, come out, publish a paper and say, ta-da, here is the solution. Um, so what we, what we tried from the start is we worked with the London Violence Against Women and Girls Consortium, which are 29 women's charities and refuges um, uh, where we started to talk to them at the start of the project and ask, what is the problem? What do you think is the issue and what would you like to have help with? And based on that, we went away and did some tests. Uh, Simon, for example, did some technical tests that hopefully are published relatively soon. Um, and we uh, tried to think about how to help the sector develop further. We worked with Petrus, which is, um, some of you might know, it's the uh, uh, IoT research consortium in the UK, um, with UCL being the lead in that, and Privacy International, which is a digital rights organization that actively works in the space uh, and tries to expand their portfolio to think not just about like um, digital rights uh, issues with regards to like surveillance, in regards to the state surveillance or industry surveillance, but also internet partner surveillance. And I'm fortunate enough uh, to say that we were lucky to uh, have increasing connection with the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport the National Cyber Security Center and Home Office. Um, so I do think it's important for research to increasingly bring back the information of the research that we share to the actors that actually have a chance to implement changes. So we try our best, I really would say we try our best, to get that message across. But as you can imagine, over the time of uh, the last two years, we had a lot of different ministers. Uh, so it's very <laughs> hard that one uh, message sticks. Um, the other really important thing is, what are our aims? Because I can talk about the topic, but what are we aspiring to do? Um, we really want to understand the role and impact that IoT technologies have on victims and survivors. Um, as I said, we don't have numbers, so the only way currently to collect that data is very much through uh, talking to support services, talking to victims and survivors, and law enforcement. Uh, we also ex want to expand the idea from potential risk trajectories. As I say, it's not just about like thinking um, about uh, what currently happens, but also what could happen in the future. If you think about all the ways there these IoT systems are designed now, how could they look like in the future, and how would we implement protective measures now before they even out into the wild? And last but not least, the awareness of victims and survivors um, and the corresponding services, so we can better understand, even if we have a discussion around this here in the realms of academia, it needs to really reflect in practice. So if we publish, publish papers over and over again, but they're not read, and they don't find manifestation and awareness in the sector, I think personally, we have lost a, a massive chance to, to change society for the better. So I really want to uh, stress that our aim is also to raise awareness in this space. And the outcomes that we uh, have so far achieved and continue to try to achieve is co-developed research so that it's not just, as I said, lab-based research and that was it, but actually that we are continuously going back to the sector, talking to them and saying, is that still aligning with your needs, your interests, your demands and expectations? Capacity building, and again, I said that earlier, I don't think really uh, academia has ever thought about the expertise that sits in these halls, in these halls here, and what that would mean for support services that are underfunded to be able to access 
just one hour of a PhD student's time to talk to someone and get no for a fact, I don't have Spyro on my phone, right? Because currently there's simply not the capacity anywhere. Um, and we know from interviews and surveys that what currently happens is when a victim is, uh, is, is thinking that they might be surveilled or there might be spyware, they're often sent to the per place where they received or purchased that device. <coughs> and if you think about the fact that, uh, or if you have ever been to the Apple shop on Oxford Street, can envision what kind of support you get there. Um, and uh, last but not least, we want to be transformative. So I really think uh, it's not worthwhile just doing research for the sake of research. So what we've done is we run two workshops. We are continuing, that's actually up, uh, <coughs> updated that we have more interviews. We run a crypto party, uh, which I'm really happy and proud of. Um, I, for those of you who are not familiar with that, it's basically um, a place where technologists uh, sit down on different tables who are angels and then um, help people with things that they're struggling with to secure themselves better. And I think um, that's a, a, you know, a, a method that I hope we can implement more. We also ran trains, which I think is also, again, like uh, an old thing to do in academia. And last but not least, the tech analysis that I mentioned <coughs> that Simon was driving. So what are our, our insights so far? I think what we have observed through the interviews, the, the surveys, um, but also our direct engagement with the sectors, there's a lack of knowledge and there's a requirement for wider awareness. How this is being achieved, I will show you in a minute. Um, a really important factor from a design perspective, but also from any form of uh, uh, you know, um, future uh, guidance is in a state of crisis, smart tech or just tech in general would be the last thing you think about. So, you know, I, uh, I'm thinking, uh, while well, I was doing my uh, undergraduate, master's and PhD, you know, I engage a lot with the technical community and how is that thing called where, where you uh, snap at someone and say, read the fucking manual? That doesn't work, okay? So um, uh, I feel like um, we need to have a better understanding that like, you can't just tell someone, well, you know, you should have protected it better from the start because it doesn't work. Uh, and we have to acknowledge these limitations at the design stage or the setup stage because during the maintenance and then the aftermath that happens, often people have added no access because they have separated, they're no longer able to access those devices. So how are we gonna make sure that they can, for example, take off their account or block their account from afar. Physical violence is easier to prove. That is a really difficult topic we've explored. Um, one thing uh, you need to think about is um, if you are currently, for example, a rape victim in the UK, you're required to hand in all your devices, um, as if you wouldn't have a more horrible time at this moment of time anyway, but they basically just want to check that you're probably, you know, I don't know, have, no, have no, not made any advances to that person that could have led to that. God knows what they would say. But the physical violence aspect is still something that haunts like domestic abuse survivors because for example, for a police investigation, if you refuse access to the devices, if there is no evidence of the devices anymore or someone has deleted them, you know, what, what are you left with to have proof? And that makes it particularly difficult if we uh, think about cases we have observed where um, the abuse was happening in re through remote control, which through IoT systems is becoming so much more easy. Um, so uh, uh, that is something to think about from a design perspective. So how are we gonna ensure that there can be no tampering happening, that there, for example, is a trail of who accessed what, when, and also that it's, and I say this as a person who uh, uh, is very active in the digital rights space, also that the police can access it. Because one thing that we have observed is, um, currently in the UK, um, if you are on, in, in a trial, it probably takes the police six months to analyze your smartphone and your laptop. Um, if you think about the escalation, that would mean if you have like multiple smart devices and the capacity that is simply not there with police forces <coughs> to analyze this. So I think we need to have a proper discussion around like how this will work in the future to collect evidence for a prosecution. Um, the other problem is increasingly people give victims and survivors and support service the advice to just go offline. And that's the fact in the UK. So if you choose to go, for example, to a, ch um, a refuge or shelter, uh, your devices are taken off you um, and your access to the internet will either be completely switched off or limited. Um, and if you think about like how many jobs are reliant on access to the internet, how this, the state you're gonna be in is already so awful. 
to not have access to internet is just not something you can suggest to anyone in this current day and age. And I think we need to think about solutions, technical solutions in this regard, of how we can ensure that there is the ability for a person to stay connected, withdraw their access, etc., so they are able to communicate with their family, etc., in a safe and secure manner. But currently, it's simply not there. And the shelter's only answer to that is just saying no internet at all. And as I said, police are behind the times in terms of tech, uh, maybe in regards to the analysis of these systems, but also in terms of um, having an awareness of looking for IoT systems when it comes to uh, a, a case in the scene. Um, uh, but again, that is something I'm sure will increase as IoT cases increases, but I would still say um, we are, at least the arguments that we've received is that they're not yet as widespread um, as probably police officers uh, detect in certain crime scenes. So I'm not planning to implement a new uh, term called smart abuse, but I do want to talk a bit about what does IoT change in this regard. Um, and one important aspect that we have observed is IoT systems, um, with the exception of like, for example, uh, a smart speaker, kind of look still the same. You know, if, you, if you've ever seen a smart kettle, they still look like a kettle. If you think about a thermostat, it still looks like a thermostat. So often for um, victims and survivors, but also support services, it's unclear to detect, you know, what can this system do? And uh, the core message I want to transport here and now is the overestimation of what these systems can do is just as dangerous as the underestimation. And we have seen this um, by receiving questions around, we, the, the, the formulation was this black round thing that runs around, what is it? Roomba, yes. So the victim was informed that there would be knives and video cameras in it. And if you think about the environment that you will be in, you will be often monitored with regards to your uh, internet usage. So you probably will not type in Roomba and what it can do and go through because most uh, us, you know, um, guidance material is not on online to search, does it really have a camera? So uh, the, the overestimation that you know perpetrators can tell victims now literally, oh that's a smart TV that can do this and that, um, is just as dangerous as not telling them that there's a smart TV in their room and they'd be able to video them while they get undressed. Um, and also the expanding and access, as a, gee, no I can't say it either, exacerbation of coercive and control. <coughs> so what I mean with that is previously it was nearly required to be physically in the same environment to make your life miserable. Nowadays, you don't even need to be in the same country as we increasingly know. But with IoT, you cannot just affect my browser or my smartphone, which are systems I can take away. But you can st you can mess up my lock, you can mess up my heating, you can mess up my, um, my, my lightning system. And to give you an example, uh, we know of certain smart, really cheap smart light bulbs where you only need to basically be in the same router network. So for example, if I have a one night stand, bring someone home, he asks me for my Wi-Fi details, I give it to him, and he's a really horrible person and stands within a 30 meter range around my house, he could switch on my light bulbs on and off and on and off. And I probably don't know what's going on because I don't know about router security, so how should I know? And I don't think the, you know, we are not prompted to set up private and public router systems. So how should anybody know? So I really want to say that like, the, the ability to not be physically present but in, impacting on the environment that a person uh, 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 lives in is really something uh, that we have not really thought about uh, su substantially. And we try to communicate these risks and the potential harms that emerge from that uh, by, uh, we have developed like leaflets around this. So we try our best to communicate that not, to, not only to victims and survivors but also policymakers. Uh, and regulators to think about like what could be systems, and th this is certainly not like finalized, but to give them an understanding what they should look at when they uh, engage with victims and survivors. And this is another one where we kind of try to communicate uh, based on like our engagement with the sector, who always asked us, what is IoT? How do I know what IoT is? You know, <laughs> how, how, how would I differentiate it from a smartphone? Where we try to kind of in very snappy uh, forms like explain what these systems can and what they should look out for. And we also have a resource list that we keep up to date. 
So um, we kind of also try to um, make clear that um, there's material already out there that is being developed by amazing institutions such as, such as the Citizen Lab, where uh, you can find information on how to make yourself secure. Now the full caveat of this is that it's down to the victims and survivors to make measures and implement measures often before they are affected. And I don't think that is necessarily a smart move and it shouldn't be down to individuals to have to do that. Um, and that's why we try to appeal to kind of uh, a, a more design feature aspects for industry that I'm talking to you about in a second. And as I said, we also run trainings, which again, I fully am aware, is not helping the large scale <coughs> brand things here because it only addresses the people who are in the room. And again, it's down to the individuals that they have to implement changes. So I think we, we try to also develop pointers for industry. So for example, I, I think it was Apple recently that prompts you, do you still want to have the location settings on? That was one thing we immediately saw would be something where key, like if you have a, a remote control access installed on your phone, that could prompt you saying, wait a minute, I don't even install that app. Why, why does it need to have access to all those things? Um, certain logs that are needed, um, as I say, for, for prosecution purposes. I really wonder, is there a means for an IPv threat model and how could that even look like? We have a colleague, uh, Julia, uh, who's actually, actually at Oxford University, um, and she's uh, hopefully examining that in her PhD. Then also customer facing staff guidance, because as I said, the current practice is that primarily people are uh, encouraged to just call on, uh, call Apple or Android or whoever, I don't know. Um, and I don't think necessarily at the end of the line is a person that knows your situation and assesses your risk assessment against you know, the, the systems that you're using. And I'm saying this with the caveat that abuse is not happening just, you know, it's not a static thing. Being physically in the environment with someone is completely different than the phase where you extract yourself out of a relationship, which is where most homicide happening. So by the time a, a perpetrator gets realizes, you know, um, it's, um, you, you might leave, they often escalate things. So, uh, and then the advice you give needs to be completely different than in that previous phase. Um, and uh, a really important point is also exchange and collaboration with support sector, because I do think that, for example, uh, we don't have enough data and also understanding of how to even remediate things that are going wrong with systems. And that would be something where, for example, Facebook could advise on how to change privacy settings, which I think they do now, but like um, uh, other uh, IoT vendors could come into play here. So I'm closely finishing, um, uh, and um, I want to say I'm fully aware our research is uh, uh, not the only thing that uh, will change the world. It is a responsibility that needs to be shared with industry, politics, and society. Um, I don't think everybody, all of these actors are currently on board discussing those issues, but I. The sad thing is, I think as these cases will become more <coughs> widespread, more prevalent, um, people will ultimately have to look at these things. I just wish we would start earlier than later to ensure that we have uh, put in the, uh, the, the modifications and changes to those systems now. <coughs> now, I don't know who is in the room. I, I suspect that there would be people from the uh, law enforcement or national cybersecurity center so we're currently working on a bigger uh, application to uh, hopefully um, to generate more information around the extent, nature, and scale of tech abuse. Because as I said, we don't have enough data of what systems are abused, how they're abused, what's the characteristics of perpetrators, we just have anecdotal evidence. And the people who are currently holding that data are probably law enforcement, but not in a kind of dedicated category as here's tech abuse which rather requires us to scrape lots of police, both cybercrime data, but also domestic abuse data, to see incidences where there were tech uh, uh, coming into play. So should you be one of those uh, lucky people to hold any of that type of data and would be interested in sharing that for research purposes, please do get in touch. Um, and I wanna end by saying, um, I'd say this, this research uh, is, is probably progressing for quite a substantial period of time. Uh, at least I'm not planning to stop whether funded or not. Um, and if you're interested in, in learning more around like current developments in the tech abuse space, international publications, but also um, events in this uh, uh, realm, we do run a monthly newsletter um, where we kind of try to inform people, anyone in the public uh, about that. So uh, feel free to sign up. Uh, please get in touch if you're interested in learning more or what
want to run a crypto party or support services one day. Um, and yeah, thank you very much and I look forward to any questions you may have. So, uh, of course, we, we have these conversations in our department, but um, sometimes, and not always, uh, the discussion goes, what uh, should be the push in terms of industry intervention from a, a tech as well as an organizational perspective? And then what is the responsibility of regulators and policymakers to intervene and change the laws so that the new times of harms, the types of harms that are not necessarily your traditional online types of harms, are being addressed. So the question to you is, what is the balance between the type of intervention that should come from industry and then really the intervention that should come from legislators and yeah. policymakers? It's funny, 
Um, uh, I don't know if you follow uh, our political landscape, but we have the online harms white paper coming out soon. It's an ongoing discussion for a while. As I said, we met with multiple ministers for that. But um, the online harms white paper basically only focuses on social media. So they're, they're, they're purely focusing on what was. They're not looking ahead of what will be. Now, I fully understand the regulator's perspective between carrots and sticks and then like uh, questions around um, why do you not want to stifle innovation? Um, I think that is a, dis you know, I, I certainly, you know me, I, I, I'm rather, from a German-speaking perspective, for intervention. Um, and I do think, for example, that the European Union is moving in that direction. Whether the, when the, the UK will move along with that, I don't know. I suspect they will have to, because the UK is not the biggest market, so whatever is being agreed in the European Union will work here. And in the European <laughs> Union, um, there's, as you know, um, the developments around certification, how we will do that, also unclear. But we would have means, if we agree on standards, um, uh, to set, for example, certain precedents that a light bulb that does not require authentication just doesn't go on the market. Mm -hmm. And we have, you know, with the IoT um, uh, code of con consumer, what is it, code of practice, we do have like means here, but I think that's only the low hanging fruit. Um, and I think there should be incentives for doing better and sticks for when they do bad. But I um, yeah, don't know if that was the most comprehensive answer I could probably <laughs> give at this moment of time. So, one more quick question. So, uh, where does the UK Met Police stand in terms of your point of view? Uh, I assume yeah. you guys are talking to the UK Met Police. Really good question. The Met Police has not talked to us, and we haven't managed to talk to the Met Police. Um, I'm talking to other police forces uh, uh, in other parts of the UK, um, but I have not managed to get a hold of anyone in the Met. So if the Met Police is here to get in touch. Um, I can put you in touch. Okay, perfect. Yeah, no, I have not, we have not, we have tried, um, but uh, there, you know, even if you send an email into the void, there's no return, and, and you need someone who has contact, we haven't received that, managed that yet. The, the reason why I ask this question is my extended team is going to work with the UK and my colleagues to okay. educate them on tech and give them education on cryptocurrency and privacy. And that's why I was curious to know where they would stand. So, yeah, I can put you in touch with them. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Let's thank, thank Leonie again. <laughs> Next, we have Ingo. Could you use the microphone and see if that improves the live stream? How's that? Is that helping at the back? How's it helping at Good. <laughs> I can see people look at me too. All right. Hi, I'm Ingolf Becker. I became a lecturer at the beginning of this year, although I've been at UCL for eight years by now. I've done a PhD and a postdoc here, so I am very much internal. Um, so I think a lot of you will know me already, but if not, this presentation uh, will hopefully let you get to know me a little better and my research over the last couple of years, what I'm currently doing, what I will be doing in the future, and what, if anything interests you, you can help me with or you can, well, collaborate with in the future. Um, still good to start a presentation without some slides from XKCD. Um, We've been trying for decades to give people good security advice, 
but in retrospect, lots of things, lots of tips actually made things worse. Maybe we should try giving them bad advice and that might work better. <laughs> the comic uh, continues with a long list of um, bad security advice, which is actually which is not that bad, it's <laughs> difficult. But, um, I will leave it at this stage. And I think one of the problems with advisors always is that there is this notion of teaching and trying to educate um, people about what is best to do without actually taking any consideration on the greater environment, what makes a security usable, workable, um, and fits into the context of use of most people. So I like to think abstractly, and this uh, might look very different to the previous very flashy presentation, yes. Uh, here come a lot of uh, boxes. So, of course, we have threats everywhere, and security is motivated by the presence of threats and uh, the response to them. Now, in the context of threats, we will have some expected user behavior, which is what we perceive people should do to be secure, remain secure, and in organizational security, you are in well, organizations, but even with your own devices, there is usually this big policy document, maybe it's a document, maybe it's a uh, non-stated but inferred preference of what users should be doing. Um, now, what the system administrators, what the policy designers think that the user should be doing is often very different from the user, understands the policy to be if they know there is a policy, and it is very much like the manual. Users uh, don't really tend to read, read. Well, most people, even the policy experts, don't tend to read their uh, other policy apart from the ones that they've written themselves. So some of my research has been looking at, firstly, the policy side to actually contrast what uh, the policy is and what users expect uh, of the policy and how they understand the policy. But of course, um, really what matters, what actual user behavior is, and how these two aspects can actually be aligned to be, well, like, hopefully the same, because once you actually have actual user behavior that matches expected user behavior, then you can make effective security. And the primary mode that um, is very popular at the moment, if you follow what comes out on industry all the time, is the so-called thing of behavior change, um, the magical recipe to get users to do exactly what um, they, uh, what you want them to do. And there is these concepts of security interventions, or security champions in the organization. I have worked with a couple of organizations to see what they understand security champions to be, and we'll dive in a lot of these aspects into more detail. Now, of course, you might say, this is great, but I've already flicked forwards already slightly so you can See, the clear, clear problem with this, unless you actually measure what the current level is, what the previous level is, how your intervention, your behavior change intervention fits in, you will um, struggle to prove what you're doing is actually useful. And a lot of interventions, a lot of research that comes out often struggles to uh, do this measurement of security over time. It is extremely difficult. Um, and therefore it requires special attention. And in my research, I've been using um, surveys uh, that are grounded in actual behavior, so context-aware surveys, and um, I've also looked at survey constructs, collected data organizations, uh, with many collaborators, of course, um, that uh, try to objectively measure the, the state of security before intervention and after. More arrows, <laughs> and this, of course, then becomes uh, one uh, enormous loop, which can actually continue for, uh, further and forward. Now, in the last year, I have been part of a research project on cybercrime and reducing the risk of cyber victimization. And one of the primary aspects that has come out of this, actually, if you do this loop and you improve your state of security, what do the threats do? Do they disappear? Well, of course not, they innovate too. So you get actually better uh, threats in response uh, to your improved security, which is what, if you look at the very technical side of computer science, if you look at malware, um, has been um, happening ever since. Literally every malware, new malware wait is an iteration of the previous one, which tries to defeat the defenses that have been put up. But we also see this in more social um, aspects of computer security, of, um, Scammers innovating out others. 
Yes, and so my research has been about uh, designing repeatable validated experiments to try to understand this and improve the general security in the um, in the presence of co-evolution of threats. So in the next couple of slides, I'll go uh, through my research over the past three, four years with correlation of many people here in the room. I have a big list of names at the end to thank um, about the various aspects of about how policies, in this case now banking terms and conditions, how banking terms and conditions um, are varying across banks and across countries, how this is, makes it very difficult for, you, for a person who has multiple bank accounts to reconcile the different, um, the different terms and conditions which are often contradictory and might even uh, contradict official guidance by, the ind by industry bodies. Um, and how they are actually difficult <coughs> to reconcile. So uh, Stephen and I and others uh, ran a study um, two, three years ago where we looked at where we collected PIN data, how many PIN individuals have, um, and how these fit into the policies and um, the terms and conditions that um, the banks state. So as a summary, we, we created this big table on advice that banks give um, on writing down PIN, changing PIN, reusing PIN, or what to do with the advice PIN slip, so the piece of paper that you get with the PIN on that one at the beginning. And um, double the black circles mean there was some advice in the terms and conditions. In many cases, there was no advice, but of course, there was a lot of contradictory advice too. Um, so basically, the in this one isolated case, it was very evident that there was a big gap between what the policy was, how people perceive the policy, and what the actual security behavior were. Just to go a little bit further, they had some glorious, um, con glorious is the wrong word, um, scary um, advice on internet banking security. This is three years, two, three years old now, but uh, many of these policies, I, don't, I doubt, have changed. So you must have firewall, antivirus, anti-spyware, all updates. You have can't, one policy stated something along the lines that you can't be connected to wireless networks. Another said you have to only be, can only be connected to encrypted wireless networks. Some of this advice on mass nodes is, of course, reasonable. Um, internet cafes for uh, doing banking is uh, maybe not very advisable. Um, using rooted devices or jailbroken devices, many banking apps actually stop you from using nowadays. Um, <coughs> But of course, if you have multiple of these advisors, uh, advice uh, hitting in, in, in your terms of condition, then you will start with a reconcile. There's also the concept with the problem with what users expect of their online banking and what actually happens in reality. So in the UK, we have the Financial Ombudsman Service, who is the adjudicator between con in, when there are issues between customers and the banks. So. This, we ran a study where we asked people, where we presented people with scenarios. So in this case, in this case and Miss K travels to work on the tube. When leaving the tube at the destination station, Miss K notices that her purse is missing. There's a police office in the tube station where she reports her purse is stolen. When she gets to work, she phones her bank account with a debit card. By this time, several large ca cash withdrawals have been made using her debit card. Now, will the bank reimburse Miss K? Who here thinks that Miss K should not get her money back? Will or should? Should not. Right, everybody agree? One person. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jens. <laughs> I will not uh, signal you out. Why do you think this is the case? Why do you think this is the case? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think it's a case of you know trying to remedy the situation as quickly as possible, right? And, is presumably not connected to the bank, right? So you know, the only way you can block the use of the card is if you actually contact the, the bank. Right. Um, so in the UK, in this case, the adjudicator ruled that uh, she should not get her money back. But uh, because the bank argued the only way the money, um, the only way the money could have been withdrawn from the debit card was if the PIN had been stored with the debit card. Because otherwise, there's no way of getting the money out, apart from lots of technical papers that say this is actually not necessarily the case. And you can guess pins quite frequently, there's a whole bunch of literature. But, um, 
So we ran this uh, in this study across three countries, uh, Germany, the UK, and the US, and in the UK, 82%, just like the majority of you thought, um, that uh, Miss K should be reimbursed. In Germany, the expectations were significantly lower. Um, in the US, <laughs> they were actually also lower than the UK. Now, once we people were uh, given the terms and conditions about banking, uh, about reimbursement, um, the KVD from the ones of the HBSC, for example, uh, the percentage <coughs> shifted significantly. The US has extremely strong consumer protection on online ba uh, on in the banking sector, and uh, nearly 100% now were uh, of the opinion that uh, the money should be returned. i have just using these numbers as a demonstration just to, to, to point out how difficult, it, how <coughs> difficult it actually is to perceive the differences in understanding, and uh, talking to a room of computer security experts, many of these things uh, might not be might be much more obvious to you than to the average um, John Doe. Yes, some more summaries. Yeah, and what should happen really with this? There needs to be a limit on the complexity. I mean, the terms and conditions can be 10, 20, 30 pages. People don't read them anyway. Uh, more harmonization across uh, <coughs> environments, um, and yeah. Better consumer protect, protection may be, but that is a different uh, matter. In a separate study, we looked at security understanding. Now, of course, you all here know how end-to-end -end encryption works, right? Um, only you and the recipient can read your messages. Other people can send a message pretending to be you. Only you and the recipient can know the messages were sent. And if somebody hacks your phone, they will be able to read your messages. All correct, correct right? No, you know that two of these are incorrect. Um, however, you know this because you have a technological understanding behind it. Lots of um, people without a technical background will uh, not will struggle to understand what is the actual features of end-to-end -end encryption. So, who has seen this sentence before? Messages to this chat and calls are now secured with end-to-end -end encryption, which means the application creators and third parties can't read or listen to them. Anybody seen this statement before? One, two, three, four, five, six, yeah. That's a good question. So this is what WhatsApp tells you when you look up, uh, when you click the information question mark button uh, next to the encryption part. Does this tell you, I mean this tells you something about it the encryption, but does this tell you enough to be able to answer the four questions, for example? It's very difficult to um, compare to condense down uh, the complexities of security to some uh, short statements. So we explored some other, um, some other potential metaphors that might need uh, <laughs> to better understand um, of end-to-end -end encryption. Um, for example, here on a treasure hidden in a place where only two of you know, um, a special language metaphor where you only know the dictionary. I mean, this is actually quite a good one, and or um, I like colors um, where you mix them with another color. So, this was a big study that actually Alves and Daha, who's not here, but uh, who, um, has conducted. And we actually ran a large survey to measure the differences uh, between um, these the effectiveness of these different statements in improving uh, the understanding of enter end encryption. And to be honest, they all did very poorly. Really explaining encryption, end-to-end uh, -end encryption um, in easy terms is very tricky. Yeah, so we ran an analytic evaluation some, and a survey of 211 participants. And yes, metaphors may hurt, although the differences were rather minor. In a separate study, I've worked with security awareness professionals. The Suns Institute uh, runs an annual um, newsletter with their survey awareness professionals about what they do to improve security in their organization. So these are uh, individuals that are embedded in organizations. And it's kind of amazing. Um, evaluation is on virtually nobody's scale, uh, scale, it's, uh, scope. It's very much a just do something mentality. Behavior change without a target behavior. And is this really what we need to in order to improve? I should go back to my second slide with the XKCD's cartoon. Um, Probably not. I've 
there is also some ongoing work currently uh, looking at survey constructs. Um, psychologists, sociologists, and um, love to, and also business studies, uh, and also myself actually, uh, like to run surveys <coughs> where specific constructs are supposed to measure aspects of security. And even in the security domain alone, over the years, there have been over 688 of these questions or question sets been developed. There's a lot of reuse, but proper validation and how this all fits together is very much an open question. And there is some interesting data mining really to be done on survey constructs. So in contrast, I have tried in my research with collaborators to do more context aware security scenarios um, and actually evaluate policy change through evaluate the effectiveness of policy change through actual behavior. One big project, this came out of the Research Institute of the Science of Cybersecurity, part one, uh, which was headed by Angela Sasser, were, was the productive security, um, productive security work, where we worked with three organizations and collected lots of in-depth, uh, conducted lots of in-depth uh, semi-structured interviews, um, did, um, designed context-aware surveys. I don't expect you to fully read this, but um, basically it's not a short question about X or Y, but a rather a long question where there is a conflict, which portrays a conflict between productivity in the organization and <coughs> security. So here, basically, you need to use BC, you need to transfer a document securely, but you can't because uh, permissions are not set, set correctly, USB sticks are unavailable. So you have options uh, that are all not, all the options that are given to the uh, respondents of the, uh, of the survey are suboptimal. They are all some sort of policy violations. So you could move it to an unrestricted folder, you could up upload the document to a public Dropbox, <coughs> um, you could share credentials, you could email the document, and uh, through various methods we triangulate behavior um, across business divisions, across uh, locations, um, with these lovely Kiviat Kiviat diagrams to see how different behavior types, so we have hierarchists, egalitarians, individualists, fatalists here, um, how there are different perceptions of security and how important security is in the organization uh, vary, and how you can actually target interventions specifically to uh, the context of the organization. So we might have a lot of fatalists who are very uh, who might be very technologically advanced, but fail to read it. The papers of all of this, this is, I'm doing a paper every two minutes along here at the moment. So there's a lot, if you're interested, go to my website, links at the end, and read the papers, it's, uh, or ask me otherwise later on. But there's a lot of interesting information here. Now, one work which I'm actually quite proud of is a collaboration with UCL. UCL has a lovely password policy, which you all uh, I'm sure are aware of where the stronger your password is, uh, the longer its lifetime is, or its time before expiration is. So if you've got a password of 50 bits of expiration, I'll leave the definition of bits aside for now, you get 100 days of password expiration. Uh, if you go for a very long, complicated password, you get a hundred with, a, with 120 bits, uh, you get 350 days of password expiration. Who here tries to go for 350 days? Yep. <laughs> Um, it's kind of an interesting study. UCL is a huge organization with uh, nearly 200,000 accounts uh, on there. And it's actually really interesting that how people move through the system. So this is a longitudinal study. We had data of uh, more than of 16 months of data and over 3 million, million interactions with the password system. How people move through the system and eventually settle on some sort of um, password um, strength that is suitable for their behavior. So people with 350 days passwords, when you next change your passwords, you're almost 90% of you will choose a password which is 250 days or so, something along with that. Because the pain of the very long password is just too difficult to bear, especially if you have to log into these machines to give lectures, for example, mm -hmm. and you then get off your phone and have to copy out your password with five special characters every time. So my password is not 250 days anymore just because it has become such a nuisance. Um, but on the other hand, if you go for people with, um, with yeah, <coughs> yes, the right 
distribution. Do you have a slide on this? No, I don't have a slide on this. Um, if people have weak passwords of 100 days, the pain of actually resetting and changing the passwords over time is so big that they choose stronger passwords too. So we actually see over time, over this period from January, from the October 26, 16 to January 20, February 2018, we see a nice increase of the average password strength of accounts and new users. We often show two weaker passwords, but then uh, step up. So in a sense, this is an effective intervention to increase people's password strength in the number of bits. If that improves security, it's a very different matter, of course. <laughs> Um, what's also interesting to see is the cost of resetting passwords. So here we have the number of passwords reset. So the number of passwords resets uh, as different lines plotted uh, by the mean lifetime of the user's passwords. People who have never had to reset their passwords have the longest, strongest passwords and in, over time increase the strength of their passwords when changing them. But people with one resets, well with two or more resets predominantly, uh, the green line and further down, the third line and further down, have significantly weaker passwords. If, they get, if you get burned more than once in the password reset system, the, you will choose, you choose weaker passwords and you will stick with the weaker passwords over time. So even over the course of over a year, uh, you will not recover to the, to the point of um, where people have a zero resets. So the, the economic, well, the I don't, don't want to say security cost because I don't think this actually correlates to security, but the, um, the cost of um, using the system is, of the reset system, is very high and uh, it makes people unhappy. Um, yes, there's also a long tail of people with having to reset passwords um, and change passwords at that time. And this, yeah. Some recent, slightly different work, but I thought I'd mention this. I've been working with Charles Rhea Lancaster for the last two years on developers and center security. He is very keen on encouraging software developers to do software security without having some security genius trying to force them, but rather do this naturally. So we've been building a developer security essentials package and have been working with 11 organizations in the various, uh, in the various <laughs> stages of pre-interviews, doing a security game, running a workshop with them, uh, doing some post-interview debrief, and um, over three months and a year later on, further interviews to see how the organization has responded, or how the developers that have responded to this security essentials package. And so far, actually, we have seem to have um, been successful, and um, we've now got four organizations at the one-year stage, and there is actually some long-lasting behavior change that was enabled through this. And um, I can't, the difference is, I don't know if you're familiar with the secure, secure uh, software development <coughs> process, but really the idea there is that you have some intervener who provides tools and techniques to the developers to provide secure software. Where our approach is more to empower um, the developers to then go out and select tools and techniques uh, themselves. And to wrap it up, I just briefly wanted to mention uh, this uh, big EPSOC project, which I was captain part on for the last year and a half, nearly two years now, uh, on cyber security and cyber crime, uh, which is very much uh, focused on um, reducing the burden of cyber security at the same time as making sure that um, old fashioned cyber enabled crimes uh, are less likely at uh, being successful. It's a very interesting project because it involves a lot of people from UCL, Penn, Surrey, uh, and industry partners, TRL, <coughs> is involved uh, very heavily. And we have computer scientists, crime scientists, uh, but we also have business schools, engineering and behavioral scientists uh, on board. Um, so it makes an interesting research project. There's actually quite a lot of psychologists there, so I don't know whether I have met them. But yeah, the idea is actually to build a theory-driven approach to understand the co-evolutionary nature of cyber um, security, building on ideas of, from evolution, evolutionary uh, biology, um, 
business ideas, and at the same time, uh, we've been building a database of crime cases and security incidences in the cyber security, the cyber crime space, and we've been conducting studies, um, we're waiting on more kind notification today, I hope it's well. Um, but uh, this kind of combination of a top-down top and bottom-up approach to actually build this kind of evolutionary framework for understanding cyber crime and cyber and risk in the cyber space to uh, make decisions about how to intervene much or much, make much better systems and how to intervene in cyber crime in the future. Right, but with that, thank you very much for listening. Um, I hopefully didn't miss any of my co-authors off of the last couple of years, but thank you very much um, for them, for their help, and thank you for listening. I hope you stay questions. In the context of the developed center security, what kind of metrics do we use <coughs> for, uh, to determine the success of the intervention? So we probed uh, on a, an awful lot, on a large number of uh, um, assurance techniques that the organizations were using before uh, we came in, in the initial interviews, and did the same thing at the end to get at least some American metric of it. But of course, all of these. Um, interviews uh, have been transcribed and we are coding them in a qualitative uh, method so we can actually pick out themes and uh, improved understanding of concepts and in many cases we can actually root them in what we did in our workshops uh, with the organization. VNV? Yeah, it's validation, validation, it's So it's about testing and once you get into requirements engineering. Requirements engineering or verifying policy versus uh, policy understanding. Yeah, or uh, at least to reduce the gap between uh, expected behavior and I have to say, I haven't quite thought about it like that. Uh, very interesting. Um, you mean like it's essentially kind of abstract away from what the policy yeah. uh, states and... Uh, <coughs> and kind of express that as a, a property that you want to verify and then you just check that. I mean, the problem is, I guess, <laughs> these policies are 30, 30 pages and uh, in written in, in, in English or German, that is very difficult to pass for other most people. I, it might be quite an entertaining exercise seeing kind of the logic tree behind that. Uh, I'm not aware, Stephen, have you ever? Have you? No. <laughs> Thank you, though. Interesting point. Can we get one more question? Then I'll ask the question. So what do you think of UCL password policy? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think as an, as an idea, it's a very cool thing to study, and the ability for us to have access to the data is very fortunate. Um, I think UCL, as most of large organizations struggle with a large, large amount of um, legacy hardware where proper monitoring and um, is very difficult and therefore, <coughs> and it is probably not happening yet, but therefore um, password expiration seems to be still the accepted um, wisdom of do, dealing with this. Of course, uh, for, I mean, uh, I don't, for the people who are not at UCL, to create a 350 di digit, uh, 350 password which lasts 350 days, it's probably about 20 plus characters with multiple special characters. So that is way over. In general, I think encouraging users to use stronger passwords to something which is sufficiently secure 
is kind of a good idea, but I think the level of sufficiently secure should be eight characters or something along the lines, considering that most of these attacks should not be able to be uh, run in an online, in a brute, absolute strong brute force manner. So if you consider a threat model where the only where the number of guests that can be executed, executed against these other systems is very low, then a uh, much weaker part of exploration should be. Um, I mean, my, my point is that I think it's, uh, it's hard to uh, <coughs> design a password policy that works for everyone in this field. So, you know, you might have some kinds of employees that have different requirements, right? Yeah. So, like, for instance, if you have to put your password in, like, 10, I, I, I use, like, I think 10 different UCL systems, HR, mm -hmm. finance, so on and so forth, I use a bunch of devices. So I cannot really use, let's say, a password manager, you know, on, on, on the CLC device. Yeah, I mean, I have the demographics about what the relationship of the individual that was with the organization. I didn't show the slide earlier, but um, the people um, that do have to use the password to log on every day to their desktops, uh, thinking of admin stuff, uh, for example, they will really struggle with an extremely long password because this will be taking up a significant amount of time. Um, while for, I mean, for the average student who uses Edge <coughs> on the devices and doesn't really use a classical computer, they will not have to type in their password as frequently. Yeah, so the context is very, is very different, of course, yes. Anyway, so if we, we don't have any more questions, let's thank uh, Ingolf. I'm a new lecturer in the department. I came here after being an uh, assistant professor in the States for two years at the University of New Mexico. I'm currently suffering from a bit of a chest cold, so I might not be as loud as or talkative as I normally am. Um, but I hope you can bear with me for the next 20, 30 minutes as I give an overview of some of the work that I've been really interested in over the last few years. Um, so as a general, uh, motivation for all of my research, both dealing with cryptocurrencies and some of the other stuff that I deal with, is that technical countermeasures seem to not meaningfully reduce the amount of cybercrime over time. Um, and you can notice this in a lot of different areas. Um, so we can look at uh, my, my previous work from when I was a PhD student, largely looked at uh, web-based malware. <coughs> And you can notice that while the amount of web-based malware slowly grew over time for a while and then kind of <coughs> declined, um, the decline was not because of you know, the lack of criminals in the space. It was more because uh, criminals were moving to somewhere else that was more profitable. Um, so even with all of this investment in trying to detect this sort of stuff, and trying to secure browsers and other sort of other things, um, it still didn't actually reduce the amount of cyber crime. The criminals just and what I do in my work is I measure that cybercrime activity to better understand um, the efficacy of various crimes and then the countermeasures against those crimes. Um, so, for example, I look at attack motivation and profit motivated attackers, as most attackers um, are, and how they make decisions to maximize revenue. I also work with intermediaries and take a particularly interest in intermediaries um, to try to implement cost-effective long-term responses. Uh, because many of these intermediaries are either becoming used or profiting greatly off of them. And as a general outline of my talk, um, all, the, all the work that I'm going to be talking about today is largely in cryptocurrencies. 
First, I'm going to talk about some market dynamics because there's been this explosion of cryptocurrencies over the last few years. Then I'm going to talk about um, a particular type of market manipulation called the pump and dump scheme. And then I'm going to finish up with a deep look at cryptocurrency exchanges, so people facilitating So when we think about cryptocurrencies, we probably all think about Bitcoin, which I imagine all of you are familiar with. Um, but Bitcoin is not really a flash of the pen. There's been uh, digital currencies almost as long as there's been internet. Uh, so DigiCash was invented in uh, 1990 by David Chong. Um, it was later shut down in the mid-90s due to lack of interest. Um, there then was an emergence of eGold, uh, where this crazy guy thought that all <coughs> Uh, money should be backed by the gold standard, and so we had this internet money that we bought gold for. Um, that This actually uh, was later shut down because of too much interest, particularly by people trying to collect their money. Uh, similarly, there was uh, another popular <coughs> digital currency called Liberty Reserve, one of these centralized digital currencies. Again, it caught on, it got really popular. Um, unfortunately, it was shut down after it was accused of laundering $6 billion uh, with money in the long run. And note that that is a floor, not the ceiling of the amount of money laundering that the feds could actually prove was on the system. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking about uh, three different types of activities. Um, you might note that these sorts of things exist in other forms. So if we look at the stock market, we can also look at dynamics of traders and other sorts of things. Um, pump and dump schemes happened in penny stocks before they <coughs> ever, um, before there ever were cryptocurrencies. Um, there's always been intermediaries to deal with money. None of these things are particularly new. Um, but what does happen in cryptocurrencies is that it allows us to study these things in um, in a way that can be really tricky in uh, the common system because uh, because of financial privacy laws, it's pretty difficult to actually say those sorts of things. Um, the other thing is that uh, the traditional financial markets have been regulated at quite a heavy level for the last, I don't know, my entire lifetime. And cryptocurrencies, while there has been emergence of various regulators interested in regulating and trying to mitigate some of these issues that we're going to talk about. Um, I recently served on a panel. I talked where, with a lawyer from a large Bitcoin exchange, uh, and he said that his exchange was overregulated. Um, but the problem is, is that none of these regulations are necessarily effective. So. so over time, there's been a big uh, jump in the profitability of cryptocurrencies. So back when Bitcoin was started back in 2009, it was worth nothing. And we've come a long way since. Um, it, it actually was fairly stable, right around a billion dollars for many, many years <coughs> until in 2017, uh, the price. Now, a lot of the reason for the emerging market price in cryptocurrencies was not because of the rise of the price of Bitcoin in previous years when there was ever a spike in this um, figure. So you might not notice this, but there's a little bump here and here and here and here. These were all bumps due to um, the rising price of Bitcoin, which brought up everything else with it. Um, whereas when the big spike happened in 2017, uh, the relative market share of Bitcoin went down as other coins started to get more popular and more profitable. So we can see Bitcoin is here in this lightish blue, but then Ethereum started in mid-2015, started becoming more of a market leader, uh, and there are some others as well. We can go to, uh, some online places that list all of the current cryptocurrencies that they know and that are traded for money. 
Um, and some of these in the top you might have heard of, so Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple. Um, some of them in the bottom you probably have not. So, you know, Ponzi coin, Argus, Argus coin. Right? And, and many of these ones at the bottom are re relatively indistinguishable. I took a screenshot maybe a year ago. how these uh, currencies move in price, and we're going to make some definitions. Um, the nature of these definitions are such that if you change them just a little bit, um, all of the findings are still about the same, so they're fairly robust. Um, so we're going to define a peak as a number that's greater than any value for about a month before and a month after. Um, the problem with cryptocurrencies is that their trading price volume are pretty uh, volatile. And so if you just define it as that, uh, many coins will have like one peak a month. And so we also had to add in some extra constraints to not over um, measure these peaks. So we define them as over a 50% increase over the lowest, lowest value in 50 days. Right, so they have to be And to try to get them, um, to try again to uh, get out some of the noise, we also only want to have them as a percentage of the max. Alongside peaks, we're going to define abandonment. So when there was that large rise in coins of 2017, people weren't just, some of the, some of the rise of the number of coins was due to people starting new coins. But a lot of it was people uh, taking on old projects and reviving them. And so we have a definition of abandonment, where the daily average trading volume goes to under 1% of the peak volume. And then similarly, um, we're going to define resurrection as uh, when it so many coins are abandoned. So we did this study in 2018, and we found that 85% of coins that were ever announced at any given time were failed before they were traded publicly. Um, we This was pre the large ICO craze. Um, we're currently doing some work in that and finding fairly similar results. We also find that 44% of publicly traded coins are subsequently abandoned. Um, some of them are abandoned a month after they first started being traded for money. Um, some of them are abandoned for years. But of those ones that are abandoned, most of them were not permanently abandoned. So they resurrected at some point for some years. We're also going to look at this large spike in price of Bitcoin um, in 2017. And in previous times when the price of Bitcoin rose, um, all of the other coins, the price rose along with Bitcoin. And then when the price of Bitcoin subsequently fell, the price of all the other coins fell along with Bitcoin. Uh, December 2017 was the first time that we saw something different. So we're going to look at some coins are going to fall along with the price of Bitcoin and other Now you can, there's lots of other things that track the price of Bitcoin, so you can look at Google Trends. Um, a lot of our work depends on um, reading the Bitcoin forums. The Bitcoin forums are started by Satoshi. They're the largest place where people go online to talk about Bitcoin. And the number of reads um, on Bitcoin Talk, which is in blue in this chart, aggregated monthly, um, about tracks the price of Bitcoin. There's somewhat of a different discrepancy here in 2013. Um, when people are they talking about the Silk Road and that sort of thing. But by and large, these two things unsurprisingly track each other. Now, our first measure of abandonment is looking at the number of currencies that are announced versus the new currencies traded. And what we can see here is that largely uh, current new currencies traded tracks the new currencies announced, except for this anomaly in 2014 
That was because in 2014, it was, um, there was this, actually in December of 2013, there was this new tool that was introduced called CoinGen, which allowed anybody to put in a few variables and they got a direct copy of Bitcoin's code with those variables changed um, for pretty cheap. And so people would develop all of these coin gen coins and then advertisement on the Bitcoin market and then they would realize that it's actually harder than you would think to start a cryptocurrency and so they would fail before they ever started trading for actual money. We can say that abandonment co-moves with creation. So um, here coins are created and then there's this small lag in the trend for when coins are Now we can look at uh, coins that are resurrected over time. So these are coins that traded for money once, then they stopped for a while, and now they're going to start again. And we can see that there's a little bit of resurrection here in 2016. Um, note that there's no resurrection back here in 2014 because there weren't any coins to resurrect. So back in 2014, there was about 40, like 40 under that coins. There just weren't enough to resurrect. Um, we saw some that were resurrected in 2016, but then once the price of Bitcoin was spiking, many more people were resurrecting coins instead of creating their own coins. We did look into this a little bit and looking to who were resurrecting these coins, uh, because from all of our looking on the posts on the forums, we were intrigued to find that many of the people resurrecting the coins were not actually the people that originally started it. It was new people trying to get rich quick off of other people's innovations. Now the price of Bitcoin has been relatively volatile over the years. Um, there's been its ups, its downs, its times in the news. Um, the biggest price spike uh, in terms of volatility price volume uh, was in December of 2017. Uh, there's been some research that looked into it that found that maybe this has to do with um, some fraud in the cryptocurrency tether. I'm going to leave it a little bit unresolved why actually this was. Um, but here we're mostly looking at it as a use case to study um, how other coins move along with it. So here in this chart, uh, we look at the change uh, in days prior and following this bubble. And the ones in red that are the coins that fell dramatically in price um, after this uh, December date. So Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, IOTA, they all fell along with Bitcoin. We notice that there's people, there's some coins that while they didn't fall dramatically, they also didn't rise dramatically. And those are in blue. So Ethereum, Ripple, Cardano all stayed, they, they didn't really change too much. But what was really interesting to us is those coins in green, so Neo and Stellar, that actually uh, had quite dramatic price and volume rises after this fall of Bitcoin. We believe it's because people were moving out of Bitcoin into another currency. This is pretty good evidence that people are finding actual use in cryptocurrencies besides just um, their use because Bitcoin is worth something. So it's showing that people think that Neo, Stellar, some of the other ones have intrinsic value to them. <coughs> So we've looked at all of these price movements of all of these currencies that you probably have heard of. However, when we looked at this for coins that you haven't heard of, uh, in the days prior to the bubble, they, they rose <coughs> dramatically, and then in the days after the bubble, in some, they fell quite sharply. And when they fell, they fell even sharper than Bitcoin fell. And we wanted to look at some of the dynamics in these low volume coins a bit more. And this led us to looking at pump and dump schemes and other price manipulation schemes. 
which is one big use case of these points. So this is an example of a telegram group where people coordinate to talk about uh, different cryptocurrencies. So there are 77 members in this. This is a quite big one that we had access to uh, through the entire time that we collected data. So we collected data in the summer of 2018. Um, and so usually how these work is that first they announce, uh, yes, when the next pump is so that people are excited and they look for it. And then they might have a countdown, so next pump is in 30 minutes. And then they'll, they sometimes will have this basic text. Some of them skip it. Some of them have images. Um, 10 minutes left. And then they'll try to obfuscate what the coin is in some way. So this particular time, they announce it from top to bottom. They might switch it the next time they announce it and do uh, bottom to top. They might embed it in an image in a way that's hard to run. Um, they might list three different currencies and put the number of which one they're going to pump. So, and then some of the ones will also say what the target is. So this means is that um, once it gets to that increased price, then you're going to sell. And so that we can get all of these people to trade at the same time and then sell at the same time. And we're all going to get rich together. And we can see when this happened, um, if you look at the price of this coin, uh, right at the time it spiked in price for about five minutes and then it sharply Uh, this work has been written up quite a bit in the news, so there was a Wall Street Journal article about it. Uh, there was also an article about it by Porter at BuzzFeed, which had this lovely icon that I enjoy. <laughs> so in total, we collected uh, just under 5,000 pump and dump symbols from Discord and Telegram. We continue to collect data after this fact, but the problem is, is that most of these channels don't want to be monitored by researchers. And so they're actively trying to cull through and kick out our researchers. So my undergrad who was doing it um, interacted with them, tried to get them to say, hey, like I'm just trying to make money. We got as many as we could. Um, if we were actively trading, we probably could have had access longer. Uh, however, there was none that um, we got and we combined this with data about the how the coins moved so price and volume data for um, the coins and tokens that were now in in these groups there is a bunch of different types of pump and dump groups so on one hand we tried to look at what this landscape looks like and so there are some that were pretty obvious so this was pump and, this was telegram groups like Pump It to the Moon. So it's pretty obvious by the title that they're pump and groups. And when they pump currencies, it's usually something like pump it, pump it. We also looked at target pumps, which were the most popular type of groups. Um, these were people like official McAfee signals. There's no notion of whether it's a pump and dump group in the name. Um, it's pretty clear if you read through it, but they try to obfuscate it just a little bit. And then uh, most of these had um, target prices along with it. So they were trying to coordinate it in a bit more structured way. We also found some pump groups uh, just copied pumps from other things. Um, so Pumping Radar just heard about a pump and decided to give it to all of their followers. So the thing with these coordination scams is that you want to get more people in on it. And so when you copy pumps, you already have the group of people from the original group that was pumped in. And so you can amplify your members group. This is particularly 
useful for bootstrapping groups. So through the process of collecting the data, we did notice that there was a couple groups that moved from just copying pumps into starting their own pump signals as they got more followers. Many of them tried to uh, have some reason for why they picked these coins, and so some of them would have you know, oh, we're pumping this because of some random news article. The point is, and actually, that any of this is true or not, it's just um, some ad hoc justification. Some of them also like to be more scientific <laughs> trading, and so they would talk about, like, oh, there's this graph, we have some science, it's gonna go to the moon. Again, is this actual science? It doesn't actually matter. The point of this is to justify uh, trading Syscoin. So we observed just under 5,000 pump and dump attempts on uh, 248 currencies over six months in 2018. Um, now, these 248 currencies ranged from the three people who tried to pump Bitcoin all the way onto people trying to pump uh, coins and tokens that um, never really got much trading on them. Now, as you might not be surprised to find, is that uh, when you tried to pump one of the top 75 coins, they really didn't rise very much. So in the five minutes between the pump signal and, uh, yeah, in the five minutes after the pump signal, these only uh, rose less than 5%. However, if you tried to pump really unpopular coins, it was quite effective. Um, so anything below the, uh, the, anything in the least popular 500 coins rose quite a lot. And we worked with economists here to do some um, pretty robust regression analysis, and what we found is that um, pump success is correlated with coin rank, so the less popular a coin is, um, the more pumps it had, and the more effective those pumps were. Um, it was negative for the number of exchanges a coin was traded on. This is because these are coordination attacks. Um, and most of these coins are only traded um, on the exchange. They're, and so you're trying to uh, get the price of the coin on a particular exchange to be amplified. The, it, the timing isn't enough to do some arbitrage. We also found that it's positively correlated with the number of public orders. So the more people that are in on this uh, scheme, um, more money everybody's in. However, when we looked at this, one thing that we pulled out of it was the currency exchanges. So, as I said, it's negatively correlated from the number of exchanges the coin is traded on. Um, to take this even to a new level, many of the times that they had these pump and dumps, they specified which exchange or exchanges they wanted to be. And what we found is that the same names kept popping up, not just across the same group, but across multiple groups. Um, there was, when we collected our data, we collected in both Discord and Telegram, and different names were popular in Discord and, and Telegram, so they were quite non-overlapping communities. But the same people kept happening, and we wanted to know why. And so this brings me to the next study that I'll talk about is, um, the roles of cryptocurrency exchanges in all of this. So what are cryptocurrency exchanges? So they're places where you go, you give them your money, and they give that you back some cryptocurrency. Um, and we collected data from the beginning of time until uh, September of 2019, and we found 481 cryptocurrency exchanges that were, had ever been in existence. Um, of these, about half of them are no longer with us. So they have died some time. Uh, this is because it, it takes effort to run a cryptocurrency exchange. It's not just the like, hey guys, let's make some money, let's start a currency exchange. Um, as we've learned from the news, uh, making cryptocurrency exchanges is actually pretty and that's one reason why they die. The other reason why they die is because of regulations of individual governments. So one of the main reasons for the large number of cryptocurrency exchanges is that different fiat currencies um, 
need to have companies based in their country in order to trade cryptocurrency. But if the regulations in the country change, then the differentiation is cool. Now, about half of these accept fiat. Um, there's a little bit of discrepancy between debt exchanges are more likely to accept fiat and ones that are currently there are a little bit less likely. But it's about half of them will accept fiat. So that means that you can take your US dollars and get cryptocurrency out of it. So back in the day, you really only could get, back in the day, every exchange accepted fiat currency because bootstrapping the network, you couldn't really assume that people just had lied around some Bitcoin or some Ethereum. However, when regulators started to target exchanges that traded their fiat currency, there became a rise of phenomenon of exchanges that didn't accept it so that they could hope to be outside of that regulatory capture. We then collected information about the fees that they're accepting because we thought that maybe um, there was some reason for like maybe higher fee exchanges accepted more fraud and so they were more likely to have cryptocurrency make more likely to accept fraud on them. Maybe low fee currencies, you could trade more. Um, and, but we found that the median fee was about 0.3%, um, with the highest fee being about 4% and the lowest fee being a number of them that had um, would pay you money to trade on their exchange. Now there's a lot of issues in our exchange, our data, so we manually went to each exchange and they like to list fees in a lot of different ways. And so we had a group of undergrads collect this information um, at two points in time, and we normalized all of the fees into an exchange's take home fee. So this is how much money at the trade from both the maker of the trade and the taker of the trade um, were the exchange action. Now we can look at when these um, so in black is the number of new coins over time. Uh, we can look at there's this cumulative number of new coins. So there's a fairly steady amount of new coins being introduced over time. Um, sorry, the new coins are in green. And there's a fairly steady amount of uh, dead coins. And these are dead coins that never uh, are disrupted. And we can also look at how the take home fee is different for different exchanges. Um, so again, these are, these show that about 50% of, um, sorry, about 50% of people have about a 0.03 um, fee, but then uh, there's a long tail of people that have quite a large amount of fees. We tried to break it down by type of exchanges. Uh, we found that, um, Exchanges that accepted fiat had slightly higher fees than other ones, but it, it wasn't that big of a difference. Next, we limited ourselves to looking at people that were profiting from pump and dump scams. So we combined the data from that paper into this one. And we found that half of the, more than half of the profits were just from a handful of exchanges. But there was a long tail of exchanges that somebody tried to have a pump and dump scam on once that eventually earned a little bit of money from them. We looked, tried to look to see if there was particular types of exchanges that um, were trying to, that were more profitable at getting pump and dump scams. So on the left axis, we see the revenue from the pump and dumps. This is on a log scale. Um, and we can see that the highest revenue earner had, um, there's this red circle, so they had over 100 trading pairs and they accepted fiat, um, and they only had a few number of coins, sorry, they only had, and however, the number two coin uh, had over 100 pair, trading pairs and was crypto only. So we came in thinking that they were these crypto only exchanges that were having this fraud, and we found it fairly evenly distributed between crypto-only exchanges and crypto-accepting and uh, uh, fiat-accepting exchanges, which is something that we weren't necessarily expecting. So as a conclusion from all of this, um, 
one thing that we're trying to concentrate on is these indirect harms. Uh, so we did measure particularly how much money certain people were making, but this fraud mostly causes harm because it undermines trust in the ecosystem. So if you can't trust the price of this coin, if you can't trust that this coin is actually good, if, um, it just undermines trust in the ecosystem. Um, we also found that attackers were adapting quickly to new technology um, and particularly targeting alternative currencies. However, we did find that they were lazy, so they were targeting coins that already had um, code base to them rather than trying to serve them. And with that, I would like to thank um, the people who worked with me to make this all possible. And Time for a couple of quick questions. <coughs> yeah. um, to what extent are the prices you showed for some of the less liquid um, cryptocurrencies that are trading against Bitcoin actually transactable versus indicative? Because the liquid assets, what we sometimes see is that the prices we get on financial data services or wherever else are actually transactable. If you try to trade at those, some of the prices are going to move. Yeah, so the thing is, is so we looked at order book data to verify some of this, right? So the price data that we used is the price data that was given in aggregate um, from the exchanges. However, they, a lot of exchanges will also give um, the specific orders that they were following. There becomes quite quickly a too much data issue with that. <laughs> Right, because we already had uh, 315 million data points or something, um, and then if that was just from five minute inter intervals in time, and so if you add every single trade onto that, it becomes too much too quick. So we did validate some of them, particularly the bigger ones. Yes, it's maybe not as big as a uh, thing, but it's still, we could see. Do you want to start setting up or call in and ask a question? Okay. Uh, I don't know if you want to ask two quick questions. I'll try. Go for it. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for the talk. Um, really interesting. I think the first question relates to when you're monitoring um, the cryptocurrency values and evolution. Uh, um, the first question relates to looking at currencies in the real world. Have you done any analysis on any lesson that you've learned from real currencies that they build? Um, comparing that to well, so the question was if we could compare it to some of the dynamics of the real world. The problem there is that while well, yes, governments rise and fall, right? Um, a lot of governments that have currency now or didn't have the same currency around a while ago, right? Like, there is some amount of entrance and exit dynamics there, but it's not as liquid as it is in cryptocurrency, so you can't find a lot of the same thing. The other big distinguisher is that uh, cryptocurrencies are uniquely uh, price volatile in the ways that uh, countries are, and they, um, so a lot of times in these very low volume coins that we're particularly interested in, They'll have no trading volume for many, many days, and then all of the trading volume for the month will be in a like one day, two day period because it's automated trading rather than human people trading. And because of like, and that's just not how real currencies work, right? Yeah, very briefly, just. I, all right. Just I mean, unfortunately, we have a hard stop with buildings, so we're going to get kicked out. So, uh, but we have some time between. You know, this talk and the keynote when we move. So if you could keep the questions offline. Thank you. Thanks. So last but not least, Philip, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot um, for, for the intro. And I'm really happy to be here and talk a little bit of my research, what I've done in the past years. So uh, in comparison to the other speakers, this will be a very focused talk. So I brought only one of my projects <laughs> that I <laughs> That I, uh, that I did in the past years. And specifically, it's about how do you ensure uh, fair fairness in digital decision making through a concept that's called public rankings. Um, and 
Specifically, so here's an overview of my talk. First of all, I will tell you what is public randomness and why do we need it. And I will also show you a few approaches how not to do public randomness. Um, afterwards, I will uh, show you two protocols that we designed uh, that generate public randomness in a secure manner. And then towards the end of my talk, I will, talk, I will show you some of our results in terms of implementation and evaluation and also uh, the deployment of our protocols in, in practice. Right. So when you talk about randomness, um, specifically in the security context, then people immediately think about secret randomness because what you do with secret randomness is you, you take it and you, you derive cryptographic key material such as encryption keys or signing keys, right? So then for secret randomness, two very important keys are you need a good source from which you can extract your random seeds. And um, your secret random string, your secret random string, uh, seed, should be ideally unpredictable forever, right? Otherwise, if that leaks, then the adversary can uh, rewrite the secret keys and then either decrypt all your data or sign messages in your name, which is something that we don't want, right? But on the other hand, there is this other notion of public randomness, uh, which is a little bit less known, but it, which I hope I can convince you is equally important. So in public randomness, you also need a good entropy source, but um, that's not enough. Uh, you also need this unpredictability property, but it only up to a certain barrier point. And after this barrier point, the <coughs> random string is released to the public and then collectively used. And to give you a little bit more of an intuition on how you can use that, let me take you a few thousand years back to ancient Greece where uh, the Greeks, they had a device called the Pinotarion, which was a lottery device. And the main, uh, the device uh, the, had two main components. It was basically a stone wall with a lot of slits in it. And attached to this stone wall was a tube. So, and when the officials wanted to select citizens for political offices, what would happen, the, the citizens would gather in a room uh, they would write their names on, onto a wooden token, throw all of these tokens into a bag, and then uh, would shuffle them, and then put those tokens into the slits at the wall in a row-by-row -row manner. And then another election official would come with another bag that had black and white dice, and you, they would fill these dice into the tube, and then afterwards, these dice were released one by one. If uh, a release dice is white, then the <laughs> corresponding row uh, on the stone wall, the citizens were selected for the office. If it's black, you move on to the next one. And you continue this process until all of the, uh, all of the jobs were given out to the citizens, right? So the very important property here is that this whole process is publicly auditable, which is, a ba is the baseline for guaranteeing fairness in such decision-making. So, and in general, public randomness is always used in decision-making processes of high stakes where fairness is a crucial, a crucial property, right? So and we've already seen in the analog world, I've already shown you one example where that's used, namely in a jury selection, but there are other examples such as lotteries, sweepstakes, election audits, or team assignments. And then also in the digital world, public randomness is a very important uh, a, a very important concept. Namely, it can be used in crypto challenges in nothing up my sleep numbers, which are values that you can use to parameterize your crypto systems. It's used in BFT consensus to resolve conflict, uh, conflicts, which is a, a yeah, notion from distributed systems. It's also used for scaling distributed systems, such as anonymity networks or blockchains. It's used in leader or committee selection. And it's also used, for example, in the Tor anonymity network to protect it against DOS attacks, more specifically the hidden services. So as you can see, there are lots of applications of public randomness. And of course, when there are lots of applications, the attackers are never that far, right? So when people try to rig 
these public randomness processes. And I brought you two examples where that has happened. So for example, in soccer, when team assignments are chosen, uh, the names of the teams are thrown, are put into a ball and they are all thrown into a big bowl. And then a person would reach in and uh, draw the names out of, uh, of the ball to, to select the assignments. And the ex FIFA president, uh, he claimed that basically the balls in this bowl were heated up and cooled down so that the person who was reaching in could feel uh, which balls they should extract, right? And thereby they could, uh, could distinguish which they should uh, withdraw. And then another example is, uh, of course, in lotteries, there are uh, a lot, there's a lot of money at stake, right? So there is no surprise that people are trying to hack random number generators so that they can win the money in the lottery, right? And that happened, for example, a few years ago with the Megabucks lottery, where this nice guy here hacked the random number generator and he made a million out of that process before he got caught. So um, to, to do public randomness, uh, uh, to come up with public randomness approaches, you have a few, uh, a few options. You can do it with a trusted third party, such that, for example, in the 60s, the RAND Corp published a book with a million random digits. And then you can could take one of the one of these random digits for, for your process. Right? If that's secure or not, that, well, that's another, another story. Um, NIST published a website where they put up a service that would extract randomness from a quantum random number generator. Uh, transform it into a random string and put it on the website. Right? If you think about it a little bit, well, then the quantum random number generator might give you good randomness, right? But the process from the output of the random number generator to the website, a lot can happen, right? So there's a big, a big problem in terms of trust. Can we really trust this to, to give us a good randomness or on, the, on this website. So ideally what you want is you want a service that works without a trusted third party. Right? And there are also different categories. One, so people propose, for example, to extract public randomness from the stock markets, from the Bitcoin blockchain, or more recently they designed slow cryptographic hash functions um, that you cannot parallelize and that would basically at the end put out a public random string together with a proof that shows that this random value was generated in a benign way. And then there are more classical approaches that use uh, something that's called virtual cryptography. Um, but the main challenges there were, are that all of these protocols so far, like distributed key generation or coin flipping, they were not very scalable. But if you think about applications as in uh, distributed systems, uh, anonymity networks or blockchains, you potentially need protocols that scale to hundreds of thousands of nodes, right? because you want to make your trust base as large as possible. So to summarize, basically the main challenges in public randomness are in terms of trust and scale. So in our project, what we specifically tried is we tried to generate decentralized public randomness in this T of N threshold security model, meaning that as long as T out of N nodes work together in, a, in an honest way, we can generate public randomness in a, in a good manner. And more specifically, what we are trying to achieve here is we want to guarantee availability such that if there are uh, up to F, which is T minus N malicious nodes, then the adversary cannot do anything. We want to guarantee unpredictability of the, of the output, so that is not revealed prematurely only at the barrier point that I mentioned before. It should be unbiasable, right? The outcome should be a uniformly random string, even under the potential influence of an active adversary. It should be verifiable such that I can take the random string together with the proof and show it to somebody else and convince them that this is a, a good random value. And it should be scalable, right? We want to execute these protocols on hundreds to potentially thousands of, uh, of partic participants. So and now you might think, OK, that's, that's all nice. That doesn't sound so hard. Um, why are we not asking, 
just n nodes, all for a random stream, and then extra everything together, and we use that as the as the public random value of our program. Right? The problem here is that the last person in this sequence can just wait until n minus one nodes have published their values, and then choose its own value in a way that the final outcome is to its liking. Right? So while this is scalable, it doesn't achieve any of the other problems. Right? It's completely insecure. So then, when you're a little bit familiar with um, with cryptography, what you might then suggest next is a commit and reveal scheme. Basically, we are forcing the participants to first commit to a value, and once we see the commitments of all, then everybody is revealing. That's a little bit better, but again, the last node in this sequence can just wait and see if the outcome, if it reveals its own value, is to its liking, and if it's not to its liking, it just refuses to, to reveal and thereby abort the protocol. So basically, you also have a kind of a bias uh, attack there, right? So um, this means we need some kind of failure tolerance in, in our protocol. Um, because nodes might potentially fail, as this second straw mentioned, right? So, and then that leads us to, well, we do secret sharing, because that gives us exactly this failure tolerance, and we combine it with commitment. However, if we do it naively, with, a, with the regular Shamir secret sharing, then you have the problem that dishonest nodes in the network can just send bad shares to, to, the, to their peers, which has the, the issue that the peers then might recover different random values, right? Which is a problem because we want to achieve that all of the nodes recover the same random value in the end because we want to use that in a decision-making process. So, and this leads us to the first semi-okay-ish solution, namely, which is called Grand Share, which is a commitment reveal scheme that uses ver verifiable secret sharing where all the nodes can make sure that the shares they receive are actually good. So that's, that's okay-ish. Um, the only two problems is it's not publicly verifiable, and, it's, and if you do the math, it's also absolutely not scalable. It has O of n cube communication and com computation complexity. However, this was like the, the starting point for, for our research, and we here specifically wanted to achieve or tar uh, address the public verifiability and scalability challenges. So that leads me to our uh, to randomness protocols uh, that address these. So the first one is called Randhound. And in Randhound, the goals, again, specifically we wanted to achieve verifiability by third parties, and we wanted to achieve scalability, so such that we can use these protocols in uh, distributed systems, uh, anonymity networks, and blockchain, and so on. Um, and how the main, the, the, the concept of the protocol is, we assume we have a client who has an interest in generating a public random stream, for example, a lottery or, uh, organization. And we have a bunch of stateless servers which <laughs> reply to the request of the client uh, with, uh, or when the client is sending them a request for to generate public randomness, they come together, produce this random string, return it to the client, uh, and, and he can then use it for, for its purpose. So how we go about this is to achieve public verifiability, what we use is a scheme called public verifiable secret sharing, where <coughs> the shares um, are encrypted and they are publicly verifiable. So not only the participants who are running the protocol can check them, but also everybody else can check, can verify that the shares are good. Um, we also use a protocol called collective signing, which allows us to protect uh, uh, to prevent equivocation attacks that the client might launch. And we uh, record everything in a transcript that we then use uh, to show that the randomness was good. To achieve scalability, what we do is um, we shard the participants, the, the nodes or the servers, into constant size groups here in blue and, and green. Because we've seen with Rancher that secret sharing of uh, of all the nodes with each other is just far too costly, right? And then we do uh, PBSS basically inside the groups, and then every group is generating an output, and then we combine all the outputs of all the groups to, to generate this uh, public uh, public random string uh, in the end. 
So now you might ask, hold on a second. Um, is do we have here a chicken and egg problem? Um, because how do we assign these servers to these subgroups, right? Can we do it in a deterministic <coughs> manner, right? Well, the answer is no, because then the adversary also knows he can predict the assignment to these subgroups, um, and he then knows which servers he needs to compromise to make the protocol basically fail, right? Which is a problem. So you want to do an, a random assignment, right? So and how do you do this random assignment? Well, maybe we want to use public randomness for this so that we have a verifiable uh, way for it. But Randhound is exactly a protocol that tries to achieve public randomness, right? So we have like a circular argument here. So, but it turns out this is not an issue um, because we can just let the client decide on this random assignment of the servers to the subgroups. Because the client has an incentive to execute this protocol. <coughs> And all he can do is, um, if he colludes with the adversary, then he is basically doing a self-DOS attack. Um, he cannot affect uh, correctness in, in, in the protocol um, due, to, due to the setup of the protocol. And we can guarantee this with, through the pigeonhole principle that if you choose these groups large enough, um, then you can show that at least one of the groups will produce a good output, which perfectly randomizes everything. And we use collective signing, as I mentioned before, to prevent that the client equiv equivocates, which means that uh, these are attempts by the client to generate two public random strings, which are both valid. Right? So basically, we force through collective signing that there is only one random output. So, and as an overview, how this roughly works is uh, we have three phases. In the first phase, basically, the client sends this initialization, which uh, contains a configuration file, which tells the servers um, the um, yeah, in, in which groups they are and what is the purpose of the, of the produced randomness and so on. Then the servers compute their PDSS shares and send it back to the client or post it somewhere publicly online, such as on a public bulletin board. Because remember, PDSS allows you to do public uh, verifiable secret chain with the third party verifiable. Then in the second phase, um, the, now that the client sees which secrets, which of the final secrets can be recovered, he chooses uh, the secrets, at least one out of each group. Um, and sends this choice of his to the service, which then verified, and if they are okay with it, they, they sign off on that. And then the, the client sends, the client collects these acknowledgements of the servers. And if he gets two thirds acknowledgements, um, then he, he's allowed to send a decryption request. Why two thirds? Well, that, is a, that comes down to an argument from distributed systems theory. Um, these two thirds prevents you that the client can do uh, an equivocation attack, a network flip. So, and he sends this decryption request, and when the service see a valid decryption request, then they uh, decrypt their PBSS shares, upon which the, the client can recover the fi final random string. So, to put this in context, Randhound basically achieves all of these properties. So it achieves availability, unpredictability, unbiasability, and third party verifiability. And I put a yellow bar here next to scalability. Um, and we, s we will see in a moment why. So when we designed this, um, we thought, OK, can we improve Randhound even further in terms of performance? We've seen it takes three round trips to generate this public random string. So one of our questions was, can we reduce the latency in, in this protocol? Another question was, can we come up with a smaller proof size? Right now, this transcript basically records all the messages that have been sent back and forth in the protocol. Um, and it can get, if the number of nodes is large, then also this transcript gets very large. And then finally, another question is, um, can we do it in a completely leaderless way? Because right now, we need the client as a coordinator of the protocol. Um, but it would also be nice if we can do it completely leaderless. So this brings me to Randbird, which is the second protocol that um, improves on certain of these aspects. So in Randbird, we wanted to have 
provide continuous or on-demand randomness generation, better latency than random, and smaller proof sizes. And how we go about this is, well, we set up a stateful randomness beacon, and then basically the idea is that the collective randomness is nothing but a collective signature, right? So basically, all of the nodes in the network, they just sign a message, and then you would aggregate all of the signatures that are coming out of it, and the final aggregate signature is a very small, uh, in this case, a Schnorr signature, um, uh, that gives you a very compact proof. The problem here, however, is that well, we need to consider that some of these nodes are malicious, right? So they might uh, they might fail or they might not forward some of the signatures that they've seen in the network. Um, so, and this is a problem. So, but if you, we're again using them here to resolve this issue, an approach that we've already seen before, namely we use special cryptography to deal with failing nodes in the system. So, and how we do this is basically, again, we use, uh, threshold signing here, we form threshold signing groups of all the servers that are available, and then each of these threshold signing groups produces one threshold signature, and then we are aggregating all of them, and that gives us the final random, final random state. Yeah. So for the setup, basically, what we're doing is here we need to ensure that the grouping is really randomized, so we basically, for the setup, use randhound to generate first one random string, then we do a distributed key generation in the groups, and then the round function to generate actually randomness is basically uh, threshold sign. All right. So and this allows us to deal with uh, a certain number of failing nodes within the, within the groups. All right, so that was already very good, and if you, if you do the analysis, then you see that Okay, now we can we brought down the proof size to basically O of one from O of n, which is good, and um, we uh, we also reduce the number of, of round trips to to basically two uh, two round trips. So, and we wanted to improve on that uh, further, which leads me to UN, which is a an alternative of RAN per It uses similar concepts, um, but it relies and probably Jens knows, uh, might know this very well. Um, it relies on threshold BLS signatures um, to generate public randomness. So that's something similar as, as the thing for example. So and here, this allows us by going to pairing by cryptography, we can reduce the round trip further um, to a single round trip. So basically, uh, everybody is <coughs> publishing their signature shares, and that's that's already enough. Right? So, and you can even go completely leaderless with this approach by forming a certain uh, by by building a, a so-called beacon chain. And what we did here is basically um, at the beginning, after the setup of the beacon, um, the nodes form a message with the round counter year one and a fixed string that everybody knows. Then they are sending their partial signatures. Once they have t out of n partial signatures, they can recover the full threshold signature uh, on this message. And then you hash this message, uh, the signature, sorry, to get your to get your random string. Then for the next round, what you do is well, as soon as you as a node see the full signature, you can already form the next message by taking the round counter and uh, append it with the signature from the last round. You sign this, once you have enough partial signature, you can recover the full one, you hash it, get the next round from uh, randomness, and so on. So as an, as an overview here, uh, to compare the different approaches, we have Randhound, which takes three round trips. The proof size is O of N. Yes, you need a coordinator, but you don't need a second, right? Because the, the servers are basically stateless. Then, when you want to uh, reduce latency, then you can go to Randhurt, which takes two round trips, proof size is O of one, you still need a coordinator, and yes, you need a, you need a setup. <coughs> and for DRAND, uh, thanks to pairing based cryptography, we only need one round trip to generate randomness, proof size is a VLS signature, so it's O of one. You don't need a coordinator thanks to this trick with a beacon chain, but you also do need a, you need a setup. 
Well, yeah. And here is again this table as I showed you before. To put it in context, rendered and de-rendered chief uh, all of these properties. Right. So then finally, a few last words to implementation, evaluation, and deployment. So while well, we implemented all of this in Go, you can find um, you can find the protocols and the cryptographic primitives in, in our crypto library Kyber, and it's also integrated in OMID and the authority framework, which are uh, which is software that we are maintaining at Didis. Um, yeah, and we use the setup in Beta Lab, which is an academic uh, cluster that you can that you can use for distributed systems uh, experiments. And yeah, we restricted the network to have more realistic, uh, uh, to have a more realistic uh, setup similar to, to the internet where communicate. So the first question we wanted to evaluate is how long does it actually take to generate randomness with Randhound? So here you see on the x-axis the number of nodes uh, and the second value is the, the group size. And on the y-axis you see the, the time it takes to generate this, these values. And overall, as a takeaway message, for 1,024 nodes and a group size of 32, it takes roughly 290 seconds to generate and 160 seconds to verify a random string. That doesn't sound too, too good, right? But for Randhound, it's really it's this one-shot approach. You just need randomness, let's say, once a day or something for your decision-making process, then roughly 300 seconds to generate is okay. If you need randomness more frequently, well, then you go to something like Renter or uh, Vran. Again, here on the x-axis, x-axis you see the number of nodes. On the y-axis, you see the latency. The green graph is Renter, and as you can see, even for 1,024 nodes, uh, the randomness generation stays below 10 seconds versus our baseline rand share. For 1,024 nodes, we were not even able to compute the, uh, like finish the protocol because it took too long. So, and overall for 1,024 nodes, it actually takes six seconds to generate uh, random values after one time set up of, of property. So we also deployed this in a prototype uh, in a service called Pulsar, which is a little bit similar to the, to the NIST uh, website, where we would regularly publish new random random values using the Randhound protocol. You also had a, a history that you could go through and see which random values were generated. And what you cannot see here is further below, you see instructions on how you can retrieve the random values and uh, verify them locally. Well, and yeah, so we already, we also had happy customers. So here, for example, Diego used uh, the Pulsar randomness to shuffle the seminar presentations order in his intro. Yeah, so that was very nice. Okay. But um, the issue with, with this was that um, all of the servers that we were using for Pulsar were still running on EPFL infrastructure, right? From a trust perspective, that doesn't give you more than the NIST randomness. Right? So what we aimed for is we wanted to really come up with a consortium of nodes distributed across different organizations so that we have a large trust base um, who then provide the service to the public to generate uh, public randomness. And that's what we did uh, finally launch this year with the League of Entropy. So uh, this is a yeah, consortium that consists of five organizations and three individuals who are all running randomness servers. This is based on, on Heron, so the pairing-based approach and it publishes new random values every every minute. And it was launched during Cloudflare Script Week uh, in, in June this year. And also the, the code, yeah, for the, you can find more details under the of entropy. Uh, and yeah, just recently we had, uh, 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 we generated the 200,000 uh, random value, which is roughly 140 days of fresh public randomness. It's still, it's still, Okay, so to conclude, um, as a takeaway, I hope I could convince you that public randomness is, is an important notion <coughs> of separate randomness, um, and it can ensure fair and transparent decision making in, in distributed <coughs> systems. Uh, the main challenges are in terms of trust and scale, and I showed you two solutions to scalable protocols in the T of N uh, th threshold security model. Um, the research paper you can find online on ePrint. And I also showed you our deployment in the League of Entropy, which is a DRAN-based randomness. Uh, 